That was fun, huh? Gosh, it was a wrestling match. <laughs> it was a wrestling match. <laughs> but I'm up for it. <laughs> Push and shove. <laughs> Welcome to the Fallen State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Fallen State is now on Patreon. So click the link in the description to support our work. I totally appreciate it. I have with me Dr. Dawah Myers. He is a professor of policy, planning, and demographic at the Seoul Price School of Public Policy at USC. And he's also the director of Population Dynamics Research Group. Wow, I'm surprised I said all that. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for coming. It was my pleasure. Uh, how did you get involved in uh, population dynamics, things like that? How did you get into all that? Well, I started as an anthropologist at Columbia University. Oh, okay. My undergraduate. One of my teachers was Margaret Mead. She got me my big break into urban planning. Oh, okay. Introduced me to key people. Um, but I was interested in people in the city, different ethnic groups. Right. And in New York, they're all jockeying for space, competing for space. Uh, and they're, I, you know, I just was fascinated by reading stories in the New York Times about what happened in this neighborhood in Brooklyn and that neighborhood in Queens and nice. all this stuff. So I was interested in people, and then the government was sort of making regulations to make things better, but then the people were following their, their own cultural differences uh, and it was an interesting problem how to reconcile that. When you were growing up, were you interested in that as a kid growing up in population and planning, well, urban planning and all that? I'm not so sure. I grew up in uh, South Florida. Uh -huh. um, um, I was interested in psychology, I think, a little bit. Oh, okay. But not so much the big, big, you know, the kids just don't think in terms of the big scale. Right. And nothing that dramatic was being built around me. Right. It was pretty low density sprawl. I was interested in, in the Everglades, the natural environment, and uh, we didn't have a lot of ethnic differences to even get my attention. Yeah. The biggest ethnic difference was, you know, a Jewish family that didn't celebrate Christmas. Oh, okay. That was the biggest ethnic difference I ever saw. Yeah. And it was a pretty small difference. <laughs> uh, are you Jewish? No. Oh, okay. No, I'm not. I can't tell because the Jews look just like the white people. I know. I can say it's a very small difference. Right. But, but they were also, well, their father was a judge <laughs> on our block, so he was you know, a very learned man. Your father was a judge? No, no, the, the, the father of that family. Oh, I see. Was a very the learned, Jewish family, your neighborhood. Yeah, a very learned man and good friends of ours. Oh, okay. You study at MIT and Harvard. Right. So you're a very smart guy. Uh, well, I, I persevered. <laughs> <laughs> when did you realize how smart you were? Uh, I didn't realize I was smart ever because I was always having facing obstacles, uh, just, you know, ideas that no one else understood. <laughs> That's an obstacle. Um, but I, I realized I was kind of like um, philosophically oriented, where I would sort of muse about things yeah. and mull them over. And I, at one point, I think when I was an undergraduate, I figured out, well, if I'm going to keep mulling over these ideas, maybe I should go and get another degree or, <laughs> or something. Yeah. But that's, it was more like trying to solve my problems. It wasn't if I was smart or not. Did you like school? Um, I got bored in school, like all guys do, I think, boys. You know, I got restless. Uh, but I had some good teachers, I think, that, you know, were able to get my attention. Yeah. And everybody needs at least one or two good teachers that had that breakthrough. How would you define a good teacher? Uh, somebody who's uh, not boring and just uh, repeating, the, the, you know, reciting what's in the, the book, but actually telling stories yeah. and changing the inflection of their voice and, and, and creating a mental image of some concept where you could, under, you could actually put yourself into the story, the drama, yeah. and you could follow it. Most, a lot of teachers can't do that. Yeah, I, I understand that. So I know that you're real. How tall are you? Two meters. <laughs> At 6'6". Six, six. Wow. Or for some people, I say, well, I'm just about the same as uh, Michael Jackson. Michael, excuse me, Michael Jordan. Michael, go, yeah. Michael Jordan. And so why do you play basketball? Uh, I try to, but it's a very hard sport. <laughs> uh, you would for a tall guy? Uh, it's it's three-dimensional sport. You have to have three-dimensional awareness. Oh, I see. And I, you know, I, I didn't have that. 
Uh, also in Florida, it was very hot in the summertime when we did, in the gym, we had no air conditioning. <laughs> when we yeah. did summer camp for basketball, it was really hot. So baseball was outdoors, is better, but I had bad eyesight. Oh, okay. So I could have been great, except for my eyes. And so, um, what type of sport did you play at all? Did you play any at all? Uh, oh, I played all these sports. I played baseball oh, I and I played basketball, you know, just but for fun. But you just couldn't go pro it on it. Well, I, did, I didn't play, or I didn't get on, I wasn't successful in, in teams. Because uh, other people could see better, jump better, you know, do other things. I did row on a crew, though. I got actually learned how to row in a boat. Oh, yeah. You know, I grew up in Florida and around the water a lot. And that was pretty dramatic, trying to work in it, learning how to do that. Yeah. It was good exercise doing that, yeah, too. It's not three-dimensional, either. <laughs> it's very <laughs> linear. It's an excellent exercise. I also like to learn how to cross-country ski. Oh, yeah? That's even better exercise. That's the best in the world, but it's only good three months of the year. Right. If you're in the right, in the northern states. So being six, six, when you were in college, were the girls all over you because you were so tall? No. I didn't, I, I don't, I didn't notice that. They didn't seem to, they, but they would look up at me a lot and say, <laughs> you're tall. <laughs> But I don't think that was a big attraction for anybody. Were you like more interested in studying and doing all that, going through high school and stuff, than dating and messing around with women? Well, no, I was not a, a, that much of a, I, w I was into books, but I wasn't a book nerd. Oh, okay. I was interested in having fun like other guys. Uh, I just, you know, wasn't a big drinker, so I didn't get wasted. And so I, I, I you know, so I wasn't incapable of doing anything else. Right. Um, but yeah, I like to like goof around with people. You are recently co-author, and and I really am looking forward to talking to you because this is all new to me for the most part. Okay. So I have a lot of questions about what you do. Okay. And um, you recently co-author an article for the Atlantic called "The Myth of a, of a Majority Dash Minority America." What do you mean by that? You know, I just got a, a tweet about that just, just before I came on your show. Somebody was complimenting me on that. Uh, that was a white guy who was complimenting me. Well, um, a lot of people have been scared about race. They think that one race is, is taking over and one race is losing. And whites are used to being on top and they don't want to ever be a minority. Yeah. Well, it's hard to define actually what white is. There's not really a, a, a sharp line around it. And the only way you can get a minority is if you draw a line really tight. And then basically, like, if a, like Jeb Bush, you know, my favorite example, you know, he's a white man, right. Bush family. Right. He married a Mexican woman from Mexico. They had kids. Are the kids white? When I look at them, I see Mexican. Well, one of them is darker than the yeah, other. Yeah, boy, the oldest son, I guess. Yeah, he's a little darker, but he's also good. He's a real bushy. He's running for a political office in, in, in Texas right now. Right. So he, he's a bushy. I mean, uh, and... and it doesn't, you know, he actually, I don't know, he's, he's both. Literally, he speaks Spanish, and he has his, the family's culture, too. Yeah. He's both. So the thing is, but all of Jeb Bush's kids then would be lost to the white race. They, like, they have no white connections. Well, what do you, what do you mean they have no white connections? Or you have Meghan Markle, my, another favorite example. And she, wrote, she married into the royal family. Oh, yeah. They had a kid, and they were all worried, well, maybe it's not, not, they weren't all worried. One person was worried that maybe the kid might be too dark or something. The kid, the, the, the queen was perfectly happy with this young lady. And, you know, but all her, she's going to turn the royal family black or something? Is it one drop rule, the old fashioned rule? That's ridiculous. So basically, Markle's kids are going to be uh, white and they're also going to be black by heritage. She's going to teach them that. The last time I saw an uh, image of the baby, he looked white. Well, yeah. He, he look, he didn't see, he look unless he get older, he may, you know, he may turn a little darker. <laughs> if it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he's going to be, he, he's his son's child, so he'll always be white. Yeah. And he's his mother's child, and so he'll be white and black. I noticed, though, that in most mixed races, mixed race marriages and couples and things like that, they tend, the children tend to identify with the darker person rather than the white person. Have you noticed that? Like, with blacks married to whites, they tend to identify more with the black people than they do the white well, side of the family. Well, Obama mean, did the same thing. Who did? Obama. Obama. Yeah, well, because of his wife. If he had married a white woman, he would have said he was white and black. Oh, okay. But he married a black woman, married into a black family, married into Chicago, 
and became, and he, and he said, I, I watched that very closely, how he chose his races, and he only chose one, black alone, because he said, that's how people treat me. That's how they look at me, that's how they treat me. But I look at him, I see, I see more of a white guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he looked like, somewhat like a black guy, but he sound white. Well, but he can, he's a great person. I mean, like he, I mean what he did in Charleston, wow, you know? What that was a do? black man speaking there. Oh, um, yeah, he married a real black person. Yeah. He went like all the way black. Well, he married her mother too. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, is that her name? What's her name? Uh, uh, Michelle's mother? Yeah. Obama married her mother? Yeah, what's her name? I can't he remember. can't get rid of her, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, she lived with him in the White House. She what? Lived with I him. know, what a horrible thing. Well, it was a great I bet that was a nightmare. No, but they were in a bubble. It was a great solution to, to lots of things. Would you want your mother-in-law living with you, be honest? Well, she had to be a pretty nice woman. Think about it. <laughs> she must be. I mean, Ooh. you couldn't, yeah, he wouldn't be able to take it. I, I know. What a mess. There's are really, there are really good mother-in-laws out there. Where are they? <laughs> I, I've had one. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Uh, you just said that'd be nice. Well, no, no, that, it was never that feeling with me. Oh, it was? <laughs> of course, she didn't live with me either. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anybody that lives with you would get on your nerves after a while. <laughs> Is it a myth that whites are going to become a minority in America? Well, the thing is, that it's just because if you draw that line and you, and you take away all the kids of whites and say they're not white, then the white population doesn't grow. Yeah. There's a lot of intermarriage. They're intermarried with Mexicans and other, other Latinos. They're intermarried with Asians. Yeah. Intermarried with blacks. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Like, uh, and 85% of these children of non-white uh, marriages, uh, you know, they have white parents. Because the whites are so many people, there's so many whites. Right. And so they account for a lot of that. It's just a, it's an artifact of how you draw the lines. And, and we're arguing you shouldn't draw a line. It's not a division. It's not plus and minus. It's not, you know, it's like overlapping. Yeah. And people have a right to dual identity. They don't have to choose. Meghan Markle's famous story is that when she was in eighth grade, she took some tests and she had to choose took one box, and she didn't ask the teacher, which one should I choose? And the teacher finally told her to choose white, Megan, just choose white. But she was not happy, and she went home to complain to her father, who was white. Yeah. And he told her, next time they make you do that, you draw your own box. Oh, I see. That's what he told her. Um, there is this idea that white would be real soon, not far from a couple years from now, it's being reported that whites will become the minority. That's just according to that statistical. See, I'm a, I'm a demographer. I know how they do the projections. And it's, it's artificial how they do it. It's not really the reality. It's not asking people, who do you identify with? Oh, it's just a calculation based on some numbers and a lot of subtractions. They're subtracting people away from the whites. And the, we, we, we think if people choose two boxes, they should not be subtracted. I'm glad to hear that because I tremble at the idea that white people may become the minority and the colored people become the majority because if they take over, it's over for America. Well, I mean, have you noticed that? No, but I mean, the colored people, there's so many different kinds of people. The black ones. Oh, the black ones are they're only, it's over, right? They're only 15% of the total, right? Yeah, thank so, God. Something like that. Well, I mean, they're not growing very fast because they don't have that many kids that fast. Well, they're too busy fighting the white man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, no, I don't know. What have you that, noticed that? No, I, 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 I don't see that. Where I, but have you noticed that black people don't build, they only destroy? They, they only destroy? Yeah. When they get mad, they do. They destroy, yeah. Yeah, even when they... Listen, they got a lot of reasons to be mad. Like what? Like what? Yeah. Ne well, turn on the news, the next police officer does something. The greatest thing to help white people to understand the, the black life is that everybody has a cell phone in their pocket with a video camera. That's the best way to share the black experience. But the people that they are showing that are being attacked, not attacked, but dealt with with cops are thug, thuggish black people no. who are running from the cops, who oh. have criminal records, oh, no. who have oh, weapons. They are oftentimes running. I've they seen have them. weapons and they, <laughs> they're, not, they're yelling and you cursing. You are exaggerating. You're exaggerating. How am I exaggerating? Name me one that was a decent person that okay. was hurt by a cop. The one that I, sticks in my mind the most is like from like three years ago, the guy in South Carolina, 
50 years old, pulled over by a cop for some tra traffic infraction. Or, uh, and when or, that was running? And he ran away. And, and he and shot him in the back like a deer. But because he didn't want to go to jail. He was well, but he didn't have any weapons. He wasn't threatening anybody. He just but ran away. But how do you away. know that as a cop, though? He shot him like because a deer. he tried to take this taser away from the cops. But... No, that, that wasn't that guy. You talk about this Scott guy, I think. He wasn't wrestling with him. He just, he just ran away. If you notice the video, if I remember the right person, just at the beginning of the video, you can see them tussling and, and it's ending, and the, guy, the black guy takes off, and that's when the cop shot him. And then later you find out the guy was running because he didn't want to go to jail, I believe, for child support or something like that. It could be something like that. But, but these are thuggish people that That's are, not a thug. I mean, he, he could be, child support could be a problem of poverty. He doesn't have the money. Or you just don't want to pay. Or I don't want, blame him for not wanting to pay, well, but I'm just the, saying. The thing is, shoot him in the back like a deer. That is what gives rise to the idea of black lives matter. I shouldn't be lecturing you about that, but that's what gives, makes me understand what, it, what that is. You Do can't you shoot him like a deer. You believe that. But the thing about it, uh, doctor, is that the black people are co supporting thugs and drug dealers and bad people. They're not even supporting. I can see if these were decent black people and these things was happening to them. But it, you're not supposed to support bad black people. You're supposed to say, hey, children, this is not what you want to be. This is like George Floyd, right? An unemployed drug addict with a criminal record. And they, they made him into a hero. Does that make sense? They made him into a martyr. Right, does that make sense? They should not have martyred him. Right, he was no hero. He right. was a drug addict. And he's dead because he resisted. And by the way, he had a white, white wife or white girlfriend too, didn't and, he? Yeah, he called her mama. And she was a drug addict, and they were trying to get off it together. He got on it because, like a lot, like a lot of white people do, he got on it because he was injured and some, had some opioids they were giving him for, inju you know, for recovery, uh -huh. and he got hooked. The opioid, opioid crisis is it's a really, bad thing, a, it's yeah. really a white epidemic. Yeah, uh, but that it, it, it's just deadly. It's it's dastardly. We should not let people get hooked on stuff like that. It's hard to get off it. But if if they dealt with the cause and effect of using drugs, you wouldn't see as many people on them. But they don't deal with the real deal. I want to ask you this: nearly three in ten Asians, and I didn't notice three in ten Asian. One in four Latino and one in five black newlyweds are married to a member of a different ethnic race group, right? Right. And more than three quarters of these marriages are with uh, a white spouse. Exactly, yeah. And so um, what does that mean? What is the significance of that? That's an amazing number, isn't it? I yeah, mean, it is. It's mind-blowing. I didn't fully realize it until just a couple of years ago. When did you get those numbers? Do you remember? Uh, no, those are one of my partners pulled those numbers up. Oh, okay. We've seen them a couple of times from you get from birth records, and they put the race of the of the t and marriage records. Right. They they, they record the race of the, the, the both parties. And so, what's the significance of that? Well, it means that the, the the barrier between white and black is being lowered. Oh, it is. Yeah, being lowered a lot. And are the people aware of that? They don't seem to notice. Uh, well, I mean, because we've seen, when you say the barriers are being lowered, uh, lowered, do you mean they're coming closer together? Yeah, they're coming closer together, and there's less of a, of a barrier between them. And there's less of a distance between them, and the fact that they start to overlap more, and um, the fact that there's that many—that's that's our national data. That's not for California. California's higher than that. Wow. But that's just, that's national data. It's pretty extraordinary. Is it is that people are more and more comfortable? Well. Some people are, are very comfortable people of, of different races. Right. And some people is, that, that ratio is pretty high. <laughs> it's pretty high, So which is good news. It's like a glass half empty, half full. I'll tell you, there's a, there's a bottom third here that's racist. And maybe it's a bottom tenth that's really, really racist. But there's a top half that's really pretty warm-hearted. Why don't we hear about that and see that? We don't hear at all about no. it nor do we see it reflected in the media or anything. Yeah. Because that might have a better impact on society it would. if that type of information was out there. You know, you're right. The problem is that the news media likes to tell stories about train wrecks, about big accidents, about big threats, alarming things, get people's attention. If you had a story and said, guess what? And nothing happened. <laughs> they wouldn't report it. Yeah. So, I mean, when I was, you know, I've been in, Cal in L.A. for like 30 years or so. And I've been amazed at how little racial strife there actually is in L.A. 
you just don't hear about big rumbles in the high schools the way I imagined it would be every day. It's, it's not news. It does not happen. It's very little strife. It ha it's, occasionally it flares up, but given all the diversity we have, how little friction there is, that's impressive, but it's not a news story. The only time we will hear about it, if a white person, a white student were to start it with a non-white student, you'll hear more about it, but because it's the blacks who are doing it to the whites or the Hispanic doing it to the whites, schools, the kids in school, you don't hear anything about it because the media and others can't use it to promote hatred between the races for their own personal gain. Yeah, I think they're just trying to dramatize big flare-ups, big accidents, big train wrecks. And why are they trying to do that, you think? Just, just to sell papers. And they're desperate, you know. They're up against the wall. Their, their business is declining. Every, the news media people are desperate to get attention. And then social media feeds that even more. They're desperate to get clicks. And so the things that get clicks the most are these, are these kind of dramatic things with a few little puppy stories on, uh, at the tail end of the news, you know, good yeah. news at the very end. Well, I know you can't trust the news. So how can we get the real story out? Because if this is true, and I don't know if I doubt it or not, how can we get the real story out to sort of change the mind of the people? Well, you have to show them something that's surprising or shocking. And they, they've, you can tell them a good story as long as it's a surprise. You can't say, a preacher makes good. Eh, that's not a surprise. <laughs> right. But if you have a gangster makes good, then that, 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 they'd cover that. So, you know, they will cover surprising things that are good. Amazing. <laughs> 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 and, so, but we can, and so we can't even trust the media anyway. So, you know, well, they don't I tell don't, you lies, yeah. but they're selective. Yeah. They're selective in what they... Um, so all these mixed races that we just, these numbers we ran off, are these mixed race people identifying as white? They have self-identified that way. And are they quiet about it, or do they let the world know, I'm white? Uh, well, they, they, they've recorded it on paper. Uh, they don't walk around saying it, but probably they must feel they look white. Right. Um, but, and, and they walk arm in arm with their bride or groom of the, pr proudly with of the different race. And that takes some doing to do that, just because you're sort of outside your social circle, your family circle. But my, my, my uh, colleague, um, you know, Richard Alba, who's got an excellent book, by the way, on this, uh, called The Great Illusion. It just came out last year from Princeton University Press. Excellent book. Um, he makes the point that when you have the interracial marriages, you're actually bonding social networks across the, the divide. Because then you have a family that has connections on both sides. And people learn about the experience on the other side. And so that, that's the, the elemental basis of social bonding. Now, you shouldn't have to be able to be forced to marry somebody in order to appreciate them. Right. But nonetheless, it does happen. And it, it, it's a nucleus for a little United Nations all, all across America. Every family has got this going on. And, and that's, um, I mean, I ran into it with somebody in Connecticut over the phone. She said, oh, yes. And then she itemized what her, her son was with a Filipino and da, 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 da. And then she's got cousins who are intermarried with blacks. I said, wow, this is an Italian-American lady. Do you believe mixed racing will end, uh, will unite the races rather than dividing them? Oh, yeah. You believe that? Yeah. Uh, what is it that divides the races? Um, it's um, opportunists who try to actually make tell inflammatory stories. That's what it is. That's the factor that does it. And they tell stories that, that have certain common themes. One is that uh, somebody's getting things they don't deserve. That you're being cheated. They're stealing what you got. And you have to fight them back. And it's us against them. They tell that kind of story. And then lots of people are, you know, are primed to believe it. What's wrong with the people that they fall for? Um, they have a simplistic view of the universe. Uh, well, I mean, like, for example, people who've got bad attitudes about immigrants, they ask surveys about that, and the ones that have the worst bad attitudes are from states where there are no immigrants. They, they think the immigrants come to America to be freeloaders, to live off welfare. They don't know immigrants are the hardest workers because they have no experience. So they believe the stories, the mythology, because they don't know better. But it is unfair when you see the illegals just coming across the borders in droves. And when they get here, they, we have to take care of them. 
uh, they take the jobs away from the citizens and things like that. So people would naturally be upset about that, right? It could be in, in some circumstances. Yeah. Um, but right now, we depend a lot on our immigrant workers. That they're like really a big component of our healthcare workers, others of our surgeons, and also of our uh, just home healthcare aides. My mom was taken care of by an immigrant uh, from uh, uh, Nicaragua, I think it was. Um, but that didn't work for cheap labor, right? Well, it was cheap, but also warm hearted and a whole lot better than getting a robot, which is what they have in Japan. Japan doesn't allow any immigrants in. Nice. None, yeah. So their population is going down. They're oh. going to go to zero, they're, they're projecting, projecting now. Oh, yeah. Do they, they, do they make a lot of babies? No. They don't? Less and less. But that's what's wrong. They need to make more babies. They're, they're, they should stop. Don't let the illegals in, but make a lot of babies. <laughs> the thing is they need all the women to be working because they don't have enough workers. Right. They don't want to have babies. They want to keep working. <laughs> and so they're in a, they're in a, a, a tailspin. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the population is going down in the white community, white on white, because they are not having a lot of babies either. They either have one or two or they abort them. Is that a good idea? Should, should we be telling them to make more white babies? Don't we need more white babies? We need more total babies. Especially white ones, like white on white. Well, I mean, you need more white babies. Uh, the birth rate for African Americans is as low as whites. Oh, it is? It's, it's really low. It's like, like 1.8. Uh, you need 2.1 babies per woman to, to break even in the long run. Right. And um, yeah, I think it's 1.8, maybe 1.7. Uh, Asians is low too, and and whites, and then Latinos. You know, you, Latinas. They, they have a baby like Natty going no. We used to count on them. You know, what, <laughs> you know what their birth rate is right now? What in America it's like 2.0. They're below break even. Also They're going in, down too. Yeah. So the most interesting fact that I think in my book Immigrants and Boomers was a minor point, but I, I discovered it at the end about what the birth rate is in Mexico. You know, Mexico, Mexico, and in, in 1970, the average Mexican family had uh, six babies. Wow. And that's your stereotype of the big Mexican yeah. family. That's right. 1970. I remember those days when they had a bunch of babies. Well, by 1990, it had dropped a lot. In Mexico. Yeah. And by today, it's down to like 2.1 in Mexico. So basically, the, when you had six, there were surplus kids being born. Amazing. We were the overflow. They came, they flooded in, into California. Oh. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, there was a lot of babies. I have like, I had five brothers. I have two left, but I have five brothers. I'm number, you know, number six. Uh -huh. And uh, seven sisters in my family. Uh, the five brothers plus seven sisters? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> wow. You know what I mean? And I, and I have an aunt who got married. She and her husband had something like 17 kids or something like that. Yeah. So they, they used to have a lot. My grandmother had a bunch of brothers and sisters. So they used to make babies. Well, they used to need farm labor back in, way back, and it was useful. Yeah. But I don't know where you put them in terms of housing. In the urban environment, our houses are too small. We can't. Uh, so the immigrants learn real fast the American way is they have fewer kids. Because you can't afford the housing. Well, we definitely. I've been. I've been telling white people for a long time. Y'all need to be making some white babies because I tremble to think that one day white people would not be ruling America. It's going to be over for America. We're going to have South Africa in America. You know what's happened over there, right? The blacks took over, and they ran this African the white people off in the road somewhere, and they're taking the land without compensation, killing them, robbing, and raping. And South Africa falling apart, just like Zimbabwe and other people. Do you tremble with me that if white people don't run this country, it's over? No. You should be. How old are you? I'm over 60. Well, you need to be trembling because you're going to be a wild wolf. You're going to be around. Well, it's, it's, it's just there aren't that many African Americans to get that big a number. In South Africa, they were the majority, like 60%, 70% of the people. But you're only 15%, so what's the big threat? So they're not going to, they won't take over? <laughs> they can't take over. And, it's, and, and as you know, in L.A. I already, in L.A. already, if you're going to win any elections, you need a multi-ethnic coalition. You, you can't win it with one race alone. You can't win it with whites alone. You can't win it with Latinos alone. You, you got, and that's how it should be. It should be a coalition but across. Most white people have left Los Angeles because they are so under attack. Oh. 
Well, they, they left a lot of them because they made a lot of money in our, selling their houses, too. Thank God, huh? Yeah. So um, I want to ask you that the media has been demonizing white people nonstop and blaming white supremacy for everything. Have you noticed that? Uh, uh, there's a lot of that, yeah. And why is that? And why do white people not speak up for themselves? Uh, they don't know what to say that's, that they won't get attacked by somebody else. <laughs> so they just stay quiet. But they're losing out by staying quiet. Um, well, they can vote, and, and that sort of tells where, where their, you know, their preferences lie. Um, well, they voted for Donald Trump, and look what happened. Some of the people voted for Obama, then voted for Trump. It's like pretty amazing, isn't it? They wanted somebody dramatic. The fools. They wanted a real man. They wanted a Hollywood guy. But he, wasn't he a real man? I call him the great white hope. In a way, you could say that, but boy, is he out of shape. He's fat. It, it, he's obese. And he's top heavy. And he, I, you know, I, I was just reading today how, how close he came to dying from the coronavirus. They had to inject him with all kinds of experimental drugs to keep him alive. Well, thank God he made it. Because he was so, he's so unhealthy. You know, it's it's just terrible. He's got the worst diet of any president ever. Yeah, he doesn't exercise either. Uh, I Unless he started not. doing it. I don't think he ever has. You know, I don't think he ever played youth sports. Oh, okay. You know how I know that? How? Because he can't be a loser. He doesn't know how to actually admit that he lost the game. That's what I love about him, don't you? No, because in, in sports you have to, at the end of the season, every team has been a failure except for one team. And you have to be willing to... They recognize that that, it's, that they those guys won it, and we'll win it. We'll, we'll win it next year. Did you vote for him? For Trump? Mm -hmm. No, I did not. No, I did not. I voted for the uh, the safe choice. The safe choice. The experienced one. Biden. The experienced one. And do you regret that now? No, he, he's he's steady as he goes. Who Biden? Biden. He doesn't even, I don't think he know that he's the president. Oh, because he's so he, low-key? Because, oh, you don't think Trump's the norm. He doesn't trump at all his, all his solutions he doesn't brag about. I don't know what's wrong with Joe Biden, but he reminds me of my father when my father developed Alzheimer's. Oh, really? Now, I don't know if that's what Joe has or not, but uh, you can so. tell that he wasn't remembering things sometime. And because uh, Joe Biden just stand there and go over, he seemed to be just standing there going over what, been written for him, and he has rehearsed it. And if he turned his eyes away from the teleprompter, he like forget right away what he was talking about. <laughs> Have you noticed that? <laughs> no, I haven't exactly, but I, I can imagine how, that, how that's true. So what I'm amazed about is how much love he's brought into the White House. Who? Uh, Biden. Uh, you you play him, right? Uh, do you know what val Valentine's Day is all about? Yeah. So money. <laughs> 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 but and yeah, it's true. A little bit of money, a little bit of cards, a little flowers. Yeah, money. But uh, Valentine's Day is to celebrate the idea of love. And the White House got it back this year for the first time. Jill Biden, I think, is the one who did it, and put these hearts all over the, the front of the White House on the lawn. And they were, they're, that's fake. That's, it's not fake. There are no there, people have no love. You think that that ooh. black woman has love? What? What that black woman name? Uh, what black woman? This is Jill Biden. The, the woman that worked with Joe Biden, the vice, so-called vice president. Oh, I mean, our Californian. Yeah, you think she had love? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think you smoke pot? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I looked at you her. You don't mean that. You can be, um, um, I, you I, can be honest with I me. I listened to her husband, and it sounds like he thinks he's getting love. Because he beta. No, no. He's a beta. He kissed her with the mask on one day at the airport. Oh. You know you beta. Oh. <laughs> Would you ever kiss your wife with the mask on? I might forget. I forget I have it on sometimes and, I, I, and, and try to do something. I even had to, taken a drink to my mouth with a glass. <laughs> oh, stupid, take it off. <laughs> <laughs> and you think Jill Biden and Jill Biden has love? Yeah. Well, I mean, look at them put the arms around each other. It's the most love we've seen in the White House in quite a long but time. But she's doing that to keep him from stumbling. <laughs> and that way they can take him right to the airport. Uh, why are you so down on Biden? <laughs> I'm just looking at the guy. I don't think he knows that he's... Well, he is the oldest president. Yeah, he doesn't know he's president. He's, he's, doing, he's as, doing as well as, as, as Ronnie Reagan, I think. What? I think so. Are you a Christian? 
Yeah. You a Christian? Not like you, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of Christian. You <laughs> can What do you mean, not like me? <laughs> well, you're probably full strength. So what now? You're probably full strength Christian. And you're not? No. Why not? Uh, well, I'm just out of, I'm not practicing. Why not? Well, because um, I don't know why. Are you the head of your wife? Am I what? Are you the head of your wife? No. I know that for sure. <laughs> uh, what's that like living with a woman that rule over you? Um, she lets me rule over some things. But and she, the rest of the time, she makes really good decisions that I, I agree with. Women can't make good decisions. Sure they can. How? They don't have a logical mindset. How can they make good decisions? You gotta be kidding me. So I, I, teach, I teach a lot of women students. Let me tell you, they're more logical than most of the men. No. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they are. They can read a book and, and repeat what they read, but when it's time to make decisions, they can't make it. Look, look at all the crazy decisions your wife has made over the years because you were listening to her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't think of any big problems, really. What, what is it like letting her rule over you like that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not at all, you know, worried about it. I'm not offended by it. I'm not, I'm not You okay nervous. with that? I'm not, no, I disagree with it, but it doesn't bother me because I don't feel at all, it, you know, there's no, I don't feel any weakness. <laughs> what type of decision she let you make uh, sometimes? Like where we're going to go on Saturday night. That's it? That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Hardy, for letting me decide where we're going to go Saturday night. Well, and she likes it, too. And then she makes decisions about what museum we're going to go to. And uh, I go along, and it's damn good. <laughs> have you ever told her, no, go sit down? Yeah. You have? Occasionally. And did she go sit down? Uh, for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I want <laughs> Amazing. How long have you been married? Uh, uh, more than 30 years. Oh, yeah? Amazing. Um, I want to talk about this decline in birth rate because of time here. In a recent interview with uh, CBS News, you call the decline in birth rate a crisis. According to the CDC, birth rate in the U.S. have fallen to a 42-year low rate. Right. And, and why is that a crisis? It's because we don't have enough young people who are going to grow up to be future workers and taxpayers. And why is that? Uh, because they weren't born. If they're not born, they can't grow up, or else you can bring in immigrants, too. Oh, I see what you're saying. But the birth rate, it, yeah, the little kids, everybody thinks they're really expensive, but they're really valuable. After age 25, these kids start to pay off big dividends in terms of their tax contributions and their work effort, all these things. Right. When they're young, they're expensive. Yeah. And I think the government needs to cover more of the costs, don't put it just on the parents, because it's everybody's benefit to have those kids. The older people are called boomers, right? Yeah, baby boomers. Yeah. Baby boomers. I know a lot of them are retiring at an early age, like 50-something and early 60s, where in the good old days, I don't know a many older people that even retired at all. Right. Why are so many boomers retiring at such an early age? Well, I mean, maybe some retire early, but on average, they're retiring later and later. Oh, they are retiring? Yeah, the earliest year for retirement was like 1985. That's when people retired, age, most people retired around age 62. Right. But they've been, Boomer's been pushing it out longer because the more educated you are, the more of a white collar job you have, the more you're a preacher or a professor or a judge, you can go a long time. Right. But if you're a, a manual worker, you wear your body out. Oh, I see. And so police officers are on the manual worker schedule. They, they get retired at 55. Yeah. Like they haven't, like they've worn themselves out or firefighters. I see. Uh, and so you see them retiring. But on, on average, boomers are, are going longer and longer. And so now that there are a few millennials and younger people, what's the solution to, uh, and boomers are going a little longer, but we're not going to be able to make, oh, I know what you, I, I read this. You think that we should start, I guess, bringing in more immigrants and things like that and and helping them to become a part of America so they can work and pay taxes and all that. Um, you wrote a book called Immigrants and Boomers, yeah. Forging a New Social Contract for the Future of America. Correct. And you talk about California being an example of the trend that will, 
that's happening in the rest of the country. What do you mean by all that? Well, people were worried about us against them, you know, native-born versus immigrants, or white against, you know, minorities. And I said, that's not the problem. The problem is we have way too many old people, not enough young people. And you should be grateful for all the young people you can get. And when I say way too many, that includes me. Uh, it's the boomers. It's, it's, and I also say it's, you know, it wasn't the boomers' idea in the first place. It was our parents' idea. So don't blame us for being too many. <laughs> but but we, were, we were born, and it happened, and we're here. And you need more young people. And whoever you're going to get them, and guess how you're going to get them? You're going to get a lot of them from immigrants. They're going to come in. They're going to be workers, and they're going to have the kids. And so they're going to help us uh, balance our, our age structure because it's really top-heavy. It's never been as top-heavy in America ever. Not even close. We used to have 24 seniors per 100 working age. That was a ratio from like 1970 to 2010. And then in 2011, the first boomer crossed age 65. And it's been a flood of people getting into the senior bracket now. Mm. And that ratio is going from 24, it's going to 48 per 100. It's doubled the weight of seniors on the shoulders of working age. And the, young, the working age is going to need reinforcement. They're going to need better education and they're going to need more people to help them. It can't just be on a few people's shoulders. But if they were to close down the borders and raise the rates to work, you know, minimum wage stuff or whatever they do, would, and if an American citizen start to make more money where the wife could stay home, the husband and the wife can make truckloads of babies, if they make more money, wouldn't they be able to stay home and have more babies? Wouldn't it benefit America better if we kept the illegals out? Because we have drug addicts and, and prostitutes and pimps and drug lords and mothers with children from Mexico and all that crap coming in, and it's draining the system. Most of the people who are coming here are coming to work. They're not coming to do those things you just said. But they are because the, our government is offering them free housing, free health care, free education, free everything. And so they're coming with uh, a welfare mentality because that's what the government is offering them. Well, th and they a lot have, of them are lazy. They, they have a higher uh, rate of working than the native-born Americans do. Like the, like the men are like 95% working. Uh, some of the Latinas are only at 50% working. African-American women are, women are up at 80% working, really high. Well, you know why that is, right? Yeah. And why is that? Uh, because oftentimes they're uh, the sole provider in their household. Yeah, and a black man too lazy to work. Well, it couldn't black man maybe couldn't find a job that was. No, they could find a job. Believe me, they ain't looking for no job. Well, I, 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 I may not know my flaws, but I know black people. You know, everybody has slackers in the family. You can say that again. Everybody does, and uh, immigrants don't have slackers when they start, but after a couple generations, they can have slackers too. That's true. So we have to bring them along. And we haven't actually taken it seriously ever to provide that, that, that means of, of occupation for everybody. But what's wrong with them? They can't provide for themselves. When I was growing up, I grew up on a plantation in Alabama under the Jim Crow laws. And oh. we didn't need someone to provide for us. Our parents provided, and they didn't talk right. us to provide. And we didn't blame the white man. We, we knew that but it you, was But a, you had a structure to work within. Yeah. I think a lot of these young guys say don't have a structure. Right, so it's not about white people, it's about not having a structure in their home. I, well, in the home, but in the community or in the workforce. Well, not just... even in community because in those days, the blacks wouldn't let us, as a little kid, if the other kids were bad, they wouldn't even let us play with the other black kids because they knew the parents were no good, right? And so it, uh -huh. it, just, it doesn't take a village, it takes a father and a mother. Well, it helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, it d definitely does help. What helps? They have a father and mother. Absolutely. It's the key to life. Well, you can survive without it, though. Right. How? Well, I, I have a single mother, p parent. Where was your father? Uh, divorced. He moved, he moved to California. He moved to, he moved to uh, West Hollywood. Why did he leave your mother? I do not know. I was too young. Oh. Have you ever asked her? Uh, well, she was upset with him um, <laughs> for different reasons. Right. Um, she couldn't control him, huh? Yeah, well, you know, anyhow, so, uh, <laughs> I, I, but I know, so I know that you can, you can still flourish well with a single parent, but 
it's easier if you have two parents. Invest is the right way if you have two. Um, am I wrong for not wanting illegals and all these immigrants in my country? I wanted to be Americans and take care of home first. And once all that is taken care of somewhere down the road, we can let in a few as needed through the front door. Am I wrong for that? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit, the, the notion of illegal is, uh, you know, when most, most white people came from immigrants, you know. Came from immigrants? Yeah, they, they, but they were. they were not illegal, though. Well, they were not crossing the border. They were not illegal because anybody could come. Anybody. Right, but they were not illegal. They didn't just <laughs> Anybody could come. sneak in like that. They, they, they just poured in the door. Are you okay with illegals coming in? <laughs> um, I'd like to have an orderly process. I think we need to have a steady stream to keep things going. I, we, can't, we, can't, we, we can't pick the fields if we don't have immigrants. We can't staff the hospitals if we don't have immigrants. In Silicon Valley, half of those companies are founded by immigrants. So, you know, these are not all freeloaders. Don't, don't remind me of that. That ticked me off. Well, they... they it's a, it, That's not a good thing. We're, we're stealing the best brains in the world and bringing them to, to California. Um, if it wasn't for white people, would there be an American? <laughs> That's what a lot of people say. Uh, because... Because white people found it and created the greatest country in the world, right? If it wasn't for them, would there be an American? Um, there are lots of people in L.A. who've been studying the opposite, saying, what would have happened if we could have kept the white people on the East Coast and we could let the Mexican population grow here? And Mexico actually, you know, the Battle of the Alamo was over a race between the Mexicans and the, and the, right. the whites. The whites wanted to keep slavery going, and the Mexicans wanted to intermarry with blacks, and they didn't want any slavery. And that was the Battle of the Alamo, really, the frontier in, in Texas. Amazing. Yeah. So if it wasn't for white people, would there... Oh, so let me just answer the question. If, if they had left Mexic I mean California to the Mexicans and all the white people went back east, you know what would happen? Um, they would be moving back east. And California would be a ghetto. All, all I know is everybody all over the world... Am I right about that? I do not know. Everybody, yeah, yeah, you do. I do not know. All, everybody oh, you all, know. I know everybody all over the world came to California because of the gold rush. Yeah, it was nice. They came to get, rush, get rich fast. Yeah. So if it wasn't for white people, would there be an American? America. Yeah. How? How? Because these people don't create, the Mexicans don't create anything. Well, have you been to even Mexico? Even when they come here, they don't even assimilate with white people. Have you, have you been to Mexico City? Mexico City? Yeah. In the U.S.? Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, in Mexico. Like over Mexico? I mean, that's quite a, quite a metropolis that they built there. But why are they trying to come here? Why don't they stay in their metropolis? They do stay. The ones that come here are from northern Mexico. They're poor uh, workers in northern Mexico. So why does northern Mexico won't go to their Mexican metropolis? Because uh, we, <laughs> we have all these jobs up here. We offer them free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know... Uh, Free stuff. The thing is, if, if, I don't, if I don't educate that little Mexican-American girl, she won't be a really productive worker. And I need her to be top producing worker to help me when I'm old. And I know she can do it. And I know she can have a really good life and buy a house and all that. But they're going to be stealing from you, too. Well, not if, not, not if she's educated, she will not she be stealing. She won't steal? Nope. She's going to be making money. Are you married to a white woman or a Mexican? A white woman. You married to a white woman? Yeah. Oh, good. But no, I've had many, many uh, workers in my house. Nothing's ever been stolen. Every, every, every housekeeper I had, a messy house stole. Really? They would come in with these big empty bags on their shoulders. Really? Oh, hi, senor. Good morning. Senor. Glad to see you. Really? And then that evening when I come home and they leave it, the bag is all puffed out with stuff. They must have thought and you had too much stuff. <laughs> Evidently. Well, you were rich. I got to put you on the hot seat. Oh. I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible, right? Okay. Okay. The hot seat. Capitalism or socialism? Capitalism. Will you celebrate White History Month with me? I started July as White History Month, and uh, this is our fourth year coming up. We celebrated White History Month okay. in July. Will you celebrate with me? Okay. Um, is Joe Biden mentally fit to be president? Yes. Did you celebrate June 10th? Yes. You did? Yes. It's not even real. 
I lived in Texas for five years. I know, I know what it's all about. But think about this. Slavery in it two, whatever, 50 years ago, 150 years ago, however long. Yeah. And when they found out in Texas, a, a number of years had already gone by. A few people in one city, black people in one city of Texas, found out that slavery had ended two years later. And they made that into a holiday. It's like you missing the airplane thinking your flight is at, tw- at <laughs> one. <laughs> you and five other people miss your flight, right? And then, and then you guys find out you missed it. And so you find out an hour later you miss your flight. And they turned that into a holiday. Does that make sense? They didn't have TV, radio, or internet to I tell them. I understand that, but that's not a reason to make that a holiday. Why not tell them, okay, so well, the real holiday is when slavery ended, oh, well, not when no, a few people found out. No, well, it's when it finally got revealed. It's a big revelation. But they made that a holiday for a few people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do you support social media censorship? Yes. Are you a liberal? Yes. Wow, no wonder your wife beat you. Have your wife ever beat you? No. She never hit you? Yes. She made you cry? Yes. Wow. <laughs> what the? Oh, let me go. Which do you prefer, self-responsibility or government dependency? A self-responsibility. Does critical race theory unite the races or divide them in the future? Oh, in the future, it unites them, but presently it divides them. Um, how will it teach them that you are me, racist guy, simply because of your color? Is that a good thing? <clears throat> There's better ways to teach it. Is that a good thing, the way that they're teaching it? No, I don't like the way they're teaching it. I'm a teacher. I can do it better. Yeah. Do you love, the, well, I asked this already, do you love the great white hope? Uh, what's that? Donald Trump. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Do you love white people? Yes. Uh, do you trust the FBI? Yes. What is a man? I, I can't define it. Uh, what is love? I can't define it. Is there only one truth, or does each person have their own truth? Ooh. Uh, each person has their own truth, but hopefully they will agree sometimes. <laughs> Thank you for taking the high seat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I totally appreciate it. Uh, so you're six. How, how tall are you? Six, six. And your wife will beat you up, made you cry on it. Well, no, it wasn't. For, she didn't make me cry by beating him on me, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the woman can make you cry with softer assaults. <laughs> <laughs> is there, thank you for coming on. I totally appreciate it. I learned a lot. Um, is there anything you'd like to promote, your website, books, and all that good stuff? Uh, no, not, I don't promote, I'm not a promoter much. But you have amazing books, though. You've written some good stuff. Yeah, nothing new, not a new book. Uh, so you don't want to promote the old? It's very interesting writing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, and you don't want to promote it? I even got somebody evangelical said that I was, you know, that I was on a mission in that book. Yeah. And they were promoting it yeah. for me. Um, but only one person did that like that. Uh, and so I'm giving you the opportunity to promote it. Uh, and we are heard around the world by everybody and their mama. Uh, okay. Well, that book, Immigrants and Boomers, it, it's a landmark. It won a prize for best article, best excuse me, best book of the year. It shows how there's pluses and minuses of all the groups, but they're complementary and they can work together and benefit each other. Right. You just got to look at what is not what's different about the other person, but look at what they can contribute to you and what you can contribute to them, and it's a partnership. Right on. We are in it together. Immigrants and boomers, and how can they get it? They can get it through Amazon on the internet. That's the best it. way. Right on. Well, thank you again for coming on. Well, thank you, sir. All right. And thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget to like, follow, ring the bell, check out the merch, Patreon, go to the little link on Patreon and support the work. I absolutely appreciate it. Let me hear from you. Next time on The Fallen State.
My understanding of religious tolerance is not finding a mushy middle ground that we all have to subscribe to. Should we allow Sharia law in America? It works well with the Constitution. No, we it should does not, allow in America. Yeah, if it does not supersede the Constitution, then we should we should allow it. Which is worse, last who support critical race theory or so-called white supremacist? White supremacist. What is a man? That's a tough question, and in this day and age, we're trying to redefine what is a man. How can you return to the Father? I think by being a good person and trying to to understand God's message, and, and that takes it takes a lot of effort. We have approximately 24 communities around the world, many different countries, that are marching with us at the same time and on the same day. We're trying to promote peace and justice. These are wonderful people, and I want to introduce you to them. Thanks for watching The Fallen State. We need your continued support. Donate to my nonprofit here. Subscribe and like the videos here. And tell everybody and their mama about the show. <laughs> no, I, I feel intimidated. No. <laughs> yeah, let's go this way. Okay. Cause you're too tall to be falling. Ain't nobody around here gonna be able to pick you up. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that would be a problem. <laughs> you want this mic off here? <laughs>